kid. Seriously. Welcome to the front-running version of the Kids Seriously Show. This is the only podcast round where we talk a big game when things are good, only to immediately turn into ostriches when it isn't, and then pretend we never cared in the first place. Every so often we get together to discuss news in the realm of Star Wars and other parts of the world that tickle our fancy, answer some questions that Kids Seriously got, and review an episode from the Clone Wars series. To my right, out on the sunny coast, soon to be of the rainy woods of Portland, more of a runner than an ostrich, it's Mark Neitzel. And to my left, it's everyone's favorite peacock. It's Luke Neitzel. Gentlemen, tell the world, how are you? I'm a glorious peacock because I don't know if you noticed when you, you drove up, but I got to I got permission to put up my Halloween decorations early. I did notice. So I got I was very excited. My partner was pretty hammered last night and started making promises that I think she regretted in the morning. But one of them was that I got to uh, I got to put all that stuff up. So we are we are good to go. The cemetery is up outside. And, uh, I just have to wait till tomorrow to put up the inside stuff. But uh, I'm a happy person. Do we get to hear the other promises, or is well, that the other, for the no, Patreon? No, yeah, but no. The other one is, is I got I got a two hundred dollars to upgrade our Halloween decorations as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it, it's pretty PG related as far as the the promises i got excited when you said upgrade like mm-hmm. from uh, idiocracy mark how you doing over there oh yeah it's been a rough weekend started out uh my quakes got thumped by sporting kansas city five to one and it wasn't even that close as they do i then woke up this morning to watch my beloved everton lose three to one to west ham winless west ham you winless west ham Not yes anymore. And at home no less and then I got to round out my sporting weekend by kissing my sister with the Vikings tying the Packers. So, yeah. yeah, nowhere to go but up from here. Yeah, I don't, I don't even really know what to say about that either. I think uh, let's just get to the news. Fire scored four goals. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. That's my silver lining. News. Guys, we're coming up on the release of the Star Wars Resistance show, which is going to come to Disney Channel on October 7th, and will likely be where we go after the Clone Wars, Wars, and if we're lucky, Star Wars Rebels. The show just released a video about it, uh, which, much to my happiness, is going to focus on a group of pilots who band together and spy on the bad guys for Poe Dameron, and who are outfitted with their own unique ships. Like the movies, Resistance is inspired by World War II movies, especially in its color choice. Gentlemen, have you seen the advertisement? Is this something you're interested in? And how happy are you for me that a few months ago, this is pretty much exactly what I said what I wanted in a new Star Wars property? Well, I'm, I'm very excited for you. Thank that you. It, I mean, it is, it is a, good, a good plot line. Um, a point of clarification here. So now, is this the pre... Episode six, seven, eight, or no, 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 no. One, two, three. Is this pre four, five, six, or is this pre six? Pre seven. Seven, eight, nine. It's it's before the Force Awakens. Do we know that for sure? Well, it's it... what we know is is that Poe da- they report to Poe Dameron and Captain Phasma is going to be a reoccurring villain. So it's around the new trilogy. It is, okay, it's so a... this is the the the. Clone of Star Wars, Star Wars trilogy, as opposed to the original Star Wars trilogy prequel. So I, I'm all confused now in my timelines. Correct, correct. Uh, I, I'm very happy for you, Maya. That sounds very, very exciting. Um, I have not seen the video you're talking about, but I saw the trailer for it, and it looks it looks good. It looks entertaining. I think my kids would get a really big kick out of it. Um, it's not something. When you weren't here, we actually talked about Disney Play, Mark and I did, about how we both thought we would end up getting it just because the breadth of stuff that Disney owns, including Marvel and Star Wars and all these other things, would make it worth it. Right. This in and of itself, or honestly any of the Star Wars shows, probably wouldn't be enough to get me to buy it. But considering I'll probably buy it anyway for all the other stuff, this is something that I would bob in and out of to see. I, it, it looks as good as any of the other shows that they put forward. Is this live action? Is this cartoon? No, this is a, the next cartoon. And it's it's a cool style of animation. I'm not even sure how you describe it, but it is not the, the same style animation that you have 
in uh, Rebels or Clone Wars. It's a little bit more, almost, it's still computer generated, but I, this is probably a bad description, but almost like it was made with paper. Samurai so, Jack, kind of? Uh, closer to Samurai Jack, not not full on Samurai Jack, but a little closer. It's it's a unique look that's different, and I like that they didn't just take the same style of animation and then just throw more characters. They're doing more to make this one unique, unique. even though it's still Dave Filoni. So they're they're branching out a little bit in just how they approach the show, and I appreciate that. So hopefully hopefully it works. And I've heard the description Top Gun in space, and you know the volleyball scenes will probably be amazing. <laughs> You know, I had a, a an interesting an interesting feeling about the look. Like, I really like the look, and I think that it could really grow on me, but I'm worried because a lot of this didn't feel like Star Wars. And I had the same feeling when I first saw Clone Wars, and I'm, I'm hoping that it grows on me much like Clone Wars did. I, it just... It, one thing... You know, there's lots of shout-outs in the trailer that I saw. Lots of little things, like R2 units, and there's, like, a... There's, like, a TIE fighter that's rehab. Like, one of the pilots is, like, an old TIE fighter pilot, and he's, like, rehashed uh, his... Thing. So there's lots of nostalgia stuff. Um, but I'm just... I, I'm hoping that it works well. I'm excited for it, um, but there's there's danger out there, too. I am a little worried. Maybe it's a matter of expectations, look. but I'm surprised that I seem more excited than you are. I'm not... I, I should say I'm excited. I'm just... There's things out there that I think could go badly that I that I didn't like, I guess. Mark? I'm watching it, it right now. Um, oh, weird. It's, it's a very odd style. It's almost... Um, in, in the way they're doing colors and lighting, it's almost a, a Japanese anime style. Yeah. Yeah. But the characters, I mean, obviously are not depicted in the typical anime form. So that's uh, it's a very interesting combination. See, I think um, that alone would be enough to get me to check a couple episodes out, just to see how that translates, what a space battle looks like in that style. Yeah, it's, it's very pleasing to look at just from this little bit. Uh, probably a little brighter, a little more colorful than maybe I would uh, originally want. But yeah, I'll give it its day in court. I think it's. I think the 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 brightness comes from that old World War II Pacific theater sort of feel that it's going for. Um, so yeah. we'll see. I mean, it kind of hovers around this area, this this space station that they're kind of undercover at. So we'll see. Moving right along, it's time for Tommy Kramer's bartender's favorite game show. It's Am I right or am I wrong? Here's how our two-player game works. There's seven questions. Our champion's going to go first in the first round. Well, I believe it's me, our challenger, will go first in the second round and vice versa in a serpentine style. At the end of each question, the point will go to whoever's correct, or if their answers are similar, whichever answer Mark likes better, which immediately puts me behind the eight ball. If there's a draw, there's a draw. No overtime here. To beat the champion, you must win it in regulation. Mark, take it from here. Okay, and um, hopefully, unlike when our two teams met on the field today, we are going to have a little more interesting and um, combative uh, game here with a clear winner. I'm really hoping to avoid that kind of muddled finish. Okay, so are you both ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Go for the throats here, okay? All right. All right, question number one. Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight was the greatest and most beloved film of 1995. Critics have been puzzling over its impact on our culture for some time now, and I want us to wade into that conversation. Now, tell me, of all the myriad ways this watershed moment in cinematic history has affected our lives, what is the single most important way it has altered the course of American history? Well, th this is an excellent question, and I think... What, what this did for the culture as far as taking actors that will be terrible after this and were terrible before this and making them entertaining, and then also launching some great actors that went on to do some really good things. So we're talking about career performances out of Jada Pinkett Smith, who, come on, like, you know, I don't even know what else we put on the list of what, what she did really well. It's not the Matrix movies. Um, Collateral. 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 Yeah, but that storyline's so uh, so ridiculous because it's so coincidental that yeah. it's it drives me nuts. You know, maybe Jason's lyric, but that's so long ago. You have Billy Zane in an Academy Award, should have been an Academy Award-nominated performance as the demon. There is no way to argue that. 
And then, you know, one of history's greatest character actors in William Sadler, who helps really just set the stage and drive a really nuanced, you know, detailed story forward. And, um, you know, like, look, look at the career arc of Thomas Hayden Church. I mean, he's given us so much, and I think, you know, I, I'm not going to give a lot of credit to Wings. I, I'm going to be that guy with the bold statements that says that about Wings. But I, I really think that the Demon Knight was the actual arrival of Thomas Hayden Church, who was now one of our most reliable actors. Maya? I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Tales from the Crypt, Demon Knight. What is the single greatest impact it's had on American culture? Well, that's nice. We, we do have a time limit here. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, now, it, under normal circumstances, the point would go to Luke just because you seem to have forfeited this. However, I am not giving him a point because he missed the most obvious answer. It, this movie introduced us via the masterful opening sequence and its use of Hey Man, Nice Shot to Robert Patrick's little brother Richard and a small band called Filter. It's not a small band. It actually had like two members and then it expanded. And they, the drummer from Filter, after Jimmy Chamberlain had the overdose, actually went to play with Smashing Pumpkins, which actually stagnated that band. It's actually kind of an well, interesting story. Actually, Shout mo- out to, to Filter. I most Filter. of that band, too, was um, uh, Trent Reznor's touring crew for Nine Inch Nails as yeah. well. So. Hey, 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 nerd. I was using small ironically. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're currently at zero, zero. I can't believe you just said Filter was the best part of Demon Knight. Question filter. number. I didn't say it was. Well, yeah. Yeah, you kind of did. Impactful. Okay. Most long-reaching. Okay. Question number two. Last weekend at the U.S. Open, Serena Williams lost in the finals after being docked a game for what were at best questionable decisions. Uh, now the very next day, I myself was screwed over out of an "Am I Right" title by a bullshit question that had Batfleck as the answer. In this vein, what is the worst decision, either on the field or by a governing body or your know, organization, in the history of sports? Wow. Wow. I go first, huh? Yeah. I don't even... Uh, there are so many. I mean, immediately what comes to mind is, is, for me, is the Cubs trading away Lou Brock, but that's kind of you know a biased answer towards myself and the teams that I care about. The biggest one is probably the Red Sox selling Babe Ruth to the Yankees as far as the biggest effect. But really when it comes down to it, it's the WWF losing Hulk Hogan over to uh, WCW. Interesting. Luke? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to disagree with that answer because while it set them back for a while, it opened them to change their entire premise, which brought forth The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin and all those other guys that ended up leading to the demise of WCW for the most part. But I'm also going to go my wheelhouse because I, I truly believe it's the right answer, even though it probably won't get me the point because neither of you are really NHL fans. But the Edmonton Oilers trading Wayne Gretzky okay. is one of okay. the dumbest I, I things. I give up. No, you're right. I in, give up. In the history of sports. You have the, yeah. I, the you know, like, when, no one has ever dominated a sport more wholly than, totally than Wayne Gretzky has. He has more assists than anyone else has points, total. And you had him in a, his prime. He didn't want to leave. He wanted to be there. And you sent him away anyway due to weird ownership and bad things like that. And it just, you know. What a horrifically bad decision. Never, Edmonton's never been the same. Okay. okay. Um, good answers if you're answering a completely different question. This was about refereeing or organizational decisions in sports. So neither of you get the point because the correct answer is that the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency's refusal to even investigate allegations against any one of Triple H's 23 title rings. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Okay. So... All right. Does anyone have a point at the stage? Here. Okay. A slow it's a start. grinder. Okay. It's a grinder. There's, there's still plenty of game left to, to pick it up here. Uh, question number three. Photos from the set of Captain Marvel were released online recently showing Brie Larson in the full Captain Marvel regalia. Now, when I saw this, my first thought, honestly, was, oh, it's too bad she's Captain Marvel because she would have made a really good rogue in the new X-Men movies. Um, now, 
clearly she's not going to be able to play both of these roles in the MCU. And, and what I'm curious about is who else is there for the upcoming X-Men movies who would be amazing to be in one of the roles, but for whatever reason they can't. Um, you know, maybe they're already in an existing MCU role, or they're too old, or they're the wrong gender, or they're dead. Uh, you know, for whatever reason, whatever reason. So you can go back into the entire history of cinema to, to draw your answer here. The question is, name the actor and the role you would cast in the X-Men movie. Well, I have to go first, so I, I guess I have to spit something out. So what jumped into my head, which... I don't know if I would have had anything until you threw out the dead part is that you would, you would have y Yule Brenner be Professor X. I mean, we know he can pull off the, the bald head. We know he, he can master the, you know, the, the whimsicalness and the, the intelligence of Professor X and he would get to sit down a lot, which helps if you're dead. So I'm, I'm going to have to go Yule Brenner. I like yeah. that. I like that question a lot and I like that answer a lot, but I think, and, and I'm so I'm happy you didn't steal this from me because I've said this for a long time. But Clint Eastwood as Logan is, to me, is perfect. Everything that Clint Eastwood did in his younger years and everything that the Logan character is about. So that's my answer. Okay, those are interesting. Those are interesting. Um, I'm afraid you didn't get the correct answer. And before I give it to you, once I give it to you, I want you just to think about it for a second and and realize just how perfect this would be. Marlon Brando as Apocalypse. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah. I, was, I like I like yeah. Brando as anything. That's good. That 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 is the winner. But but I, I like both of your answers. They were good tries. Question what? number four. What is now, that? Who's that French as a actor? Zombie, um, my friend? apathy towards oh. the distinguished competition is pretty well known at this point. Who is the worst DC character? This is you. Is this to me? Yeah. Which is good well, me. I'm going to, him. I'm going to. Well, you know who it is. It's Plastic Man because he's basically a rapist in the comics and is a terrible character. Everything about him is awful, and so um, they basically make a joke about him uh, molesting people, and it's been that way for years and years and years. Other ones, you know, I I would say anim Animal you get, Man. You get one. Whoa, 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 whoa! Oh, no, nothing. Hey. This isn't skeet shooting. You don't get buckshot. I'm not I'm saying I'm saying oh, other oh, in contention. I have to sit here and listen to you guys go off and off and off about the San Jose earthquakes, goddammit, and uh, the Minnesota Wild or whatever we're talking about for hockey. I'm going to talk a little bit about DC characters and Animal Man, and I'm, I'm oh. fine with that. I get my part in this stage too, boys. All right, fair enough. If you want to spend time bashing on how crappy DC characters are, I will allow it. Oh, see? Go, please, please, go please. finish, finish, please. Uh, it's the only one I was going to talk about is Animal Man because I think he's a horrible character. In addition, but Plastic Man is the answer. It's the correct answer. Well, I, I'm going to go with I'm going to go a little more mainstream, and I I'm going to say that um, even even though people may like Jason Momoa, like comic book Aquaman is dumb as fuck, and the fact that he's like a prominent character that they force at us is dumb as fuck. And, you know, like, you can say, you know, Plastic Man is a terrible character, like Ray Palmer's wife and how they presented her was terrible or whatever, but they don't matter in the grand scheme of DC Comics, but everyone knows who Aquaman is, they know his dumb orange suit, they know all that garbage, so I'm, I'm gonna go with Aquaman, because he's culturally more important, and that's sad. Okay. Um, I'm actually a little upset you didn't get this one. It's Green Lantern because his power oh, doesn't work against a yield sign. Fuck you. Put a school bus in front of him and suddenly he's just like a regular dude. Ugh. Okay. Oh, what? but yeah, put some put some white wings on the side of his blue helmet and then he's just a badass. Clearly, okay. uh clearly Luke hasn't read Jeff Johns' run on Aquaman. Clearly. <laughs> uh, Luke hasn't read anybody's run on Aquaman, just so you know. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm a little disappointed in how you're doing, but we still got time to pick it up here. Um, I was Green Lantern number, for Halloween last year. <laughs> number five. Um, Which one? Were you Kyle Rayner or were you, uh, were I you was John Hal Stewart? I was, I was Hal Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I would have preferred to have been John Stewart, but I don't think I'm going to yeah, go no, that's that not way. Good. Yeah, yeah, that's... yeah, that's not good. Are we done? Yeah, I hope We're so. Done. Okay. All right. You, you guys haven't scored enough points to earn all this riffing. Okay? So let's focus here. <laughs> 
Question number five. Um, both Luke and I scored tickets to a special two-day theater run celebrating the 50th anniversary of the original Night of the Living Dead. Now, everyone knows this is the single greatest zombie movie of all time. But I want to know, what is the most underrated zombie movie of all time? Is, is this Super me first? Yes, yeah, okay. Um, uh, underrated's a, a hard term, because I think everyone who has seen this movie is going to tell you it's amazing and awesome, but I don't think enough people have seen this movie to do that, and that is the Korean movie Train to Busan, which is awesome, and it came out just like a year or two ago, so when the, the genre already feels kind of done and played out, but it's thrilling, it's intense, you care about the characters, it was a new setting, uh, it's a fabulous movie, it's on Netflix, it's almost Halloween time, everyone should watch it, even when I don't get the point, because you're going to pull some dumb shit at the end to not give either of us one. Maya? Um, I have an answer, he can get this right. Well, I don't really like horror movies, so that puts me at a disadvantage, so if I had to put pick a movie about zombies, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, High School Musical. That's all I got. <laughs> I don't watch zombie which, movies. Which is very funny because there actually is a Disney Channel show about zombie high school that my is children really? watch. Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, and they try to interact with the non-zombie high school kids, and we all learn about getting along. Oh, nice. That's nice. Okay. Well, um, I, I think we've all rightly sussed out how this entire game is going. Yeah. And yes, you're both wrong yet again. The uh, actual answer... And, and I, I agree with you on Train to Busan, except I think anybody who sees it accurately rates it i think it's it's unknown isn't underrated there's a difference the actual answer is 28 weeks later oh that is good yes yeah. and it and it's underrated too i mean first yeah. off that opening sequence alone that 10 minutes when he's being chased through the farmhouse is fantastic that's the only part i've seen and turn off after that that's good it, it it's as good as anything in any other zombie movie and you also have not only Rose Byrne, which is always an automatic Ayo. plus, but you have Jeremy Renner getting burned to death, which <laughs> yeah, is big that's points. a huge. Yeah, I can okay. appreciate that happening. Where's Number Marco? six. Eminem released a new album last week with little fanfare, and it immediately became a bestseller. Um, it wasn't without controversy, though, as it features Marshall using an extremely homophobic word that has appeared in his previous works. Um, now, this time even he has publicly admitted that it was a mistake and he went a little too far. Uh, my question to you is what artist, athlete, celebrity, well-known person do you most want to support but can't because of their behavior? Maya. Well, you want, the truth is, the truth, back when we were in college, I really liked a Michigan quarterback named Tom Brady because he was a guy who had to fight for every start he ever had at Michigan whenever they were down he uh he they or they they put in they'd start Drew Henson and then they get down and then they put in Brady and then he would come back and bring them back um obviously there's the flake gate and all that stuff but what bothers me most about Tom Brady is the fact that he is a Trump supporter and um like him and Derek Carr the quarterback of the Raiders is another player I like I I, I really have a lot of problems supporting those guys because of their political beliefs. Okay. And I think they would have problems supporting me with my political beliefs. So, uh, for, for me, it's Kirby Puckett. I mean, that was growing up. That was the end all be all of athletes you can have in Minnesota. He was beloved. I mean, we have statues of him outside of target field. He's the greatest player the twins have ever had. He's the most popular athlete in Minnesota, Minnesota sports history. And then after he was forced into retirement and his years went on, we found out what a, a shitty guy he actually was and that he, what he presented to the public was not who he really is. And I have a really hard time reconciling how I feel about him because that is someone I just, as a kid, thought was walked on water. Um, and it was a real lesson to learn these people you idolize aren't what you think they are a lot of the time. And, and I still still have a hard time... If, if he had played for any other team, I'd be like, fuck that guy. Like, what a piece of shit he turned out to be. But I have a hard time with that still, even as an adult, because he was my guy for my whole childhood. So that's that's mine. That's a pretty good answer. It's not the correct answer, but it's a pretty good answer. No, the, the correct answer is James Woods. 
Oh, because yeah. he is awesome yeah. in everything, but he is such an unbelievable Make America Great Again prick in in real life that it's just it, it ruins Casino for me now, and I love Casino. I disqualify people that take um, long-standing roles on Family Guy. Uh, I don't watch Family Guy, so <laughs> exactly <but laughs> good for you. Okay, so let's recap. Through six questions, we unfortunately have zero points have been awarded to both sides. So this last question is a pretty big deal. And you know, just to reiterate for the fans out there, if both of you answer this correctly, then it'll be a tie and Luke will win. Now, if both of you answer it incorrectly, then it will also be a tie and Luke will win. So really, Maya, your job here is to win it. Is to get this question right while he gets it wrong. Okay. And I start, don't I? Yeah, you start. Yeah, so Luke goes I'm first. Able... Okay. Okay. Unless he wants to, to you know, be a gentleman and punt it to Maya, he's, he can he's certainly do that as well. I would, I would love to do that. I will punt it to Maya. No, it's all crappy. Okay, Maya. God. This is the question for you. The Intercontinental title, yes. established in 1979, while not the biggest title in the WWE and frequently only defended at the mid-card, is arguably the most prestigious. Long viewed as a title to be held by those who demonstrate superior in-ring technique, it has been held by the illustrious likes of Pat Patterson, Rob Van Dam, Ric Flair, and the Honky Tonk Man. But there are really two men who stand above the rest in their title reigns. It's Mr. Perfect! One is the proud son of the greatest state in the Union, a man who excelled in multiple sports and brought pride and honor to Minnesota. It's Kurt Hennig. The other wasn't even born in America. My question to you, who is the greatest intercontinental champion of all time? Kurt, Mr. Perfect Henning, or Bert the Hitman Hart? <laughs> no, excuse me, Bret Hart. Uh, it's it's uh, Mr. Perfect. I don't care. I don't care if I lose. It's Mr. Perfect. It was Mr. Perfect. It is Mr. Perfect. It will always be perfect, Mr. Perfect. Okay. Now, now before now before we go to Luke's answer, I, I want to make sure that the mic's cute and we're recording so that we capture this for posterity. Luke, you son of a bitch. <laughs> the fact is, is that no matter what I answer here, if I want to keep my title, I know the correct answer that I have to give. But the facts will never change what happened at SummerSlam in the greatest match of all time, where the excellence of execution won the title from Mr. Perfect, only to go on later and use a phrase that I think kind of fits to you right now, where he said, if I was going to uh, give the United States an enema, I would shove the hose right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. If I was going to give kids seriously an enema, I'd shove the hose right in Mark Neitzel, but I'm going to say Mr. Perfect. <laughs> Ladies, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Are you repeat that answer? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Mr. Perfect. And ladies and gentlemen, Luke has repeated as champion of the Kid Series, Am I Right, Am I Wrong, by virtue of a tie. That's yes, okay. Mr. Perfect is the greatest intercontinental champion in the history of the WWE. And I, I'll allow That's it. perfect! I'll allow it because Bret Hart went and won actual top title, world championship title. So you can have your intercontinental title. So my, he had the perfect plex, which is the greatest move mm -hmm. in wrestling history. It's not even close. He had the best outfits. He's perfect. Yeah. He had <laughs> so, the best manager, Bobby yep. So so Some say you're the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. You said that perfectly. <laughs> exactly. So, Luke repeats. Good yeah. job, Maya. I, I was pulling for you on that one. Son of a bitch. <laughs> Wait, that's my mom. Damn it! <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, hey, uh, if you're out there feeling lonely, maybe you like the sound of Mark's diatribes or the smug attitude of his taller brother. Maybe you're drawn to this lazy surfer aesthetics of my voice, but maybe you just need someone to talk to in the words of John Lennon. If you're lonely, you can talk to me. Email the show, tweet the show, immerse yourself in the show. Friend of the show, Jed writes, When you were young, did you ever think you would see reboot after reboot after reboot of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Discuss. You know, no, I didn't because they got it so perfectly in the movie <laughs> in 1990. 
<laughs> that I thought they would just stop after that and be done with it. Um, n- no, and I, it doesn't really seem like they've they've gotten it right or whatever. So I wish they just got something that was fun and maybe maybe there isn't a way for it to to be done right for my standards because I absolutely loved that cartoon. I absolutely loved that first movie. I honestly still think that first movie is good. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, and I can't I can't tell if it actually is, but I, I actually think it holds up better than most anything else from the 90s, early 90s. Um, so maybe they just can't meet my expectations of, of what it should be, but no, I really didn't think we'd get all these, these different incarnations of it and that they'd still try and they'd still fail so much and then keep trying. Mark? Yeah, I'm pretty surprised by it too. Um, not, not only that they keep retrying, but that they continue not to really embrace the source material because basically the original comic from which all of this is taken is basically a giant sort of pun on Daredevil and that whole universe. And to not take it and not go back and kind of use this, you know, kind of crazy concept to sort of deconstruct superheroes and, uh, you know, make fun of the MCU, that seems to me to be a real layup. So not only am I surprised that they keep redoing it, but that they keep not going the obvious route with it. Problem is, is they made too much money in the '90s with that cartoon and the toys, so they're they're looking to re get that that toy money rather than doing the very adult themed comic book that it was based on. The uh, mm-hmm. this is a family show. Uh, you guys are brothers, and my brother, when he was a third grader in Fillmore, California, nearly started a riot when the uh, projector for that movie didn't work. He started stomping his feet yelling turtles and there was like a sea of angry <laughs> elementary school kids we almost we almost tore that motherfucking place down it was i was intense but uh, i haven't watched the turtles movie since i i w- loved that movie so much i had a friend in middle school and i'd go to his house after school and we would watch that movie and we'd divide up every single character uh so that we each had half the cast and then we would say every line of the characters that we picked because we watched it so many times so, it is the greatest thing Elias Cotis has ever done. Oh, he's had an underrated career. I mean, come on, The Prophecy? Who doesn't love that movie? Me. <laughs> and everyone else. Me. Should we talk about Clone Wars? Oh, that's right, we do that, don't we? Season 2, Episode <laughs> it's 9. Thing. It's still a thing. Uh, season 2, Episode 9, Grievous Intrigue. For everything you gain, you lose something else. Hey, this is written by the dude who created The Tick and directed by Giancarlo, Vol- Giancarlo Volpe. Grievous Intrigue announces the return of friend of the show, General Grievous, who has tricked a Jedi Master, Jedi Master into being trapped as a way to flush out Kenobi and Skywalker, I think? Enlighten us. Yeah, they had a plan of some type. So the narration starts, we were on a whole new storyline. Grievous is apparently winning the Outer Rim, which he seems to always be doing in opening narrations, but never in actual show arcs. Oh, he's dominating outside the show. Yes. Like, off screen, he he is... He wins everything he does that's not on the show, but I suppose this is his first appearance this season, and we're, what, nine episodes in, so apparently... He's been kicking a lot of ass. Yeah. He has had some time. It's the Outer Rim. That's like the Italian army taking, you know, the island of Corsica. Big freaking deal. Yeah, well, that's where the whole show has been. Uh... (laughs) But they uh, you ask Tatooine, the people of Ta- the good people of Tatooine, yes, <laughs> and Moss Eisley, if they would agree with that statement. So we uh, they've been trying to find Grievous for a while, and they can't find him, but he's winning battles anyway. And we open where they have finally found him, and Grievous's troops are attempting to board a Jedi cruiser. Now wait, I can I stop you right here because this automatic right off the bat confused me because I thought they said that they couldn't predict where he was going to be. But then they found him and were attempting to capture him. Did I completely misunderstand this? Or? No, that that's right. It's like, they haven't been able to find him, but now they found him, so they're going at it hard to try and get him. But the reason they have found him is because he wants them to find him, because he really wants to kill Obi-Wan. It's a trap! So, yeah, no, this whole thing was... got a... that for later, but the... Eh, whatever. Go on. T- take it as a whole. 
So we, we answer, and I found this to be a relatively good reintroduction to Grievous, who, as I just said, we haven't seen this entire season. Uh, it's got good music. It's got kind of a horror movie feel to it, which is a reoccurring theme this season. And he slices his lightsaber through the door. So you're on the clone side of the door and you just see this door getting lightsabered. And then they kind of show his foot enter and then they pan up to him. So it's a pretty good entrance. And here we meet, uh, I believe, a Jedi we're seeing for the first time, though he is in background shots of the movies, which is Eoth Koth. And he gets into a fight with his little troopers um, who get taken out pretty quick. And Grievous is able to use the commando droids which are the more skilled, the actual skilled fighting droids rather than the garbage that you normally throw at everything. And they are able to take Koth hostage. Good music in this, good opening sequence. I was relatively satisfied with this. They then... I, I have one, one thing here, though, too, and this is, it kind of annoys me throughout the entire thing. Doesn't Grievous using his lightsabers really kind of cheapen the whole lightsaber as a weapon of the Jedi thing? Uh, I don't think so, because if the, the backstory of Grievous is it's not that Dooku made him those lightsabers. It's that he collects the lightsabers of Jedis he's killed and then uses them against other Jedi. Well, well right. No, I, I mean, I get why he has them, right? I mean, I have, you know, soccer balls around my house. It doesn't mean I can score goals like Ibrahimovic, right? So just because he has the lightsabers, you know, in a little collection, his being able to use them and fight Jedi... Am I the only one who thinks that that just kind of lessens the mystique of a lightsaber? Well, if it made if if it did, it happened in Attack of the Clones, and if it did, Ray sort of defeats that argument anyhow. So well, and I'm actually okay with this because what okay. they talk about is that that Grievous was he doesn't have the Force, but he's been trained in every other way by Dooku as a Jedi would. So he has all the the skill of how to use it and how to wield it. And with all his cybernetics, he's able to fight better than most people are able to fight. But the drawback to him, and the reason he eventually loses, is because he can't actually use the Force. Which is what limits him. So, I think they they didn't want to introduce a new Sith Lord in Revenge of the Sith. But they wanted there to be lightsabers and there to be a formidable physical opponent for the Jedi. So they came up with Grievous in this instance, and I personally am completely fine with it. I like him as a villain in the movie, though so far I've been really dissatisfied with him as a villain in the TV show. All right, I guess I'm on my own here. You are on your I own. Did, I did like Lair of Grievous in the last season when you got to see his house, and it was pretty creepy. He's, he's like, had his moments, but my problem with him is that he always loses. Right. And if he's going to be this big, horrible bad guy that we're afraid of, he can't lose in every single episode that he's ever in. And spoiler alert... Guess what's going to happen to him in this episode? He's going to win? No. Oh. So Grievous then, in a move I like, actually with with Koth captured, calls the Jedi on the, the <laughs> their hologram thingy to brag about how he has him and kind of tortures him in front of him and is about to kill him but doesn't kill him, being like, hey, I'm going to draw this out because I know it'll hurt you guys more. Basically telling them, hey, come come find me so they can get him. And the Jedi, of course, rush headfirst into everything because they're arrogant as fuck and they screw most things up. So they decide they're going to launch a full fleet out there to go and try and save Koth. And the reason they know where he is is because Koth does kind of sign language in while he's being tortured to give his coordinates. So they're able to find him and race after it, but that's really what Grievous wanted anyway. So uh, it's not really a big deal for him. Anakin and a new Jedi we meet that's called Galea, they go in one ship with some clones to go find him while uh, Obi-Wan leads a giant fleet of ships that are going is she from somewhere else in the series or is she brand new she's brand new okay. we haven't seen her before and i do not remember her from the movies okay. so i think this is the first introduction to her and when i first saw her walk on screen i became really terrified of where they were going to go not yeah. only with a throwaway jedi character but a female throwaway mm -hmm. throwaway jedi character so we'll see how that plays out but uh they they end up going and and land, and a space battle breaks out. This is a very battle-heavy episode. So, lots of fighting. Uh, it starts as a space battle. Anakin has this tiny ship with Galea, and their plan is is they're, they're not in the same star system, but they're going to light speed jump into the system while the battle's going right next to Grievous' ship, so no one will notice them. And this works. They end up underneath it and are able to hook up into it and jump in. Okay, so they're in space, right? 
There's no up or down in space. Yeah, but, I know where you're going with this. But you would have gravity on your ship in order to maintain where you are, which would create an up and down. Right. But, so, if you're attached underneath Grievous's ship, right, your ship's gravity is still the same, right? You would, your ship would still be pushing down on your floor. Yet, when they're, hey, when they're, when they're sitting there in the ship, her braids are dangling like she's upside down. Now, Either the gravity is going to be keeping her in normal, or it's going to be space and there's going to be no gravity, in which case they're going to be floating in, and I think I've just gone cross-side. Well, you know, normally I would smugly dismiss this, because I like to, as Maya will attest, I like to smugly dismiss things. Everything. But I'm going to give you credit on this, because while I was watching this with my six-year-old daughter, she definitely was like, wow, this seems to just defy all natural laws of physics, because her braids aren't mm -hmm. dangling, and as someone who was specifically targeted as a little girl, I'm offended about this. So I, I'm going to give you some credit on that, that her braids are a big hey, deal in which way hey, they, they face. Details matter. This is right. also a space where uh, explosions happen, even though there's no oxygen and fire outside, and Leia doesn't immediately die or freeze to death. Or... She's Mary Poppins. Yeah, exactly. Um, I will say that I was always offended on the Millennium Falcon at the end of A New Hope, where um, they didn't both crawl quote unquote upwards because the Millennium Falcon's gravity is in the center of the ship. And so when they go to the gun wells, one's supposed to walk the other. Or like way. when a ship starts listing. I have a There's question. No gravity in space. Ships don't list. They just turn and you, your orientation just ah. Yeah, oh. it's al it's almost like they're for kids. Uh I'm just going to move on past my previous question. So they they board the ship and they are able to uh start going through their fighting trying to get caught. Meanwhile, Grievous boards Anakin or uh, Obi Wan's ship in his attempt to go get Obi Wan, and um, we have a series of battles in these different sections of the ship. They are able to get Koth out of there, and it's kind of a every turn. Well, but that's what Grievous wanted. Nope, but that's what Obi Wan and Anakin wanted, and they kind of go back and forth that way. Um, and how it basically ends is uh, Obi Wan's about to be sucked out of a ship, and uh, Galia of all people. Ends up fighting Grievous, which is the moment I was like, well, she's a female. They're going to immediately kill her or need her, ha have to have the big men come and save her. But she basically gets Grievous out of the way and then saves Obi-Wan from being blown out the ship. Then she convinces Anakin not to suicide himself by jumping in another, by chasing Grievous, rather, but by going to another ship and escaping, or actually, excuse me, Obi-Wan. Um, and then they are able to fly away as all the ships kind of explode. Uh, but Grievous disappears down into this planet that they're bordering, which is a planet no one's ever really been to. The war hasn't touched here yet. So um, Koth thanks them as he has been saved, and we kind of fade to black at that point. And I have trashed this episode since the moment we started it. I had a really fun time with this one, to be honest. It was very Star Wars-y to me. Like, it was big space battles. It was more of a saving Private Ryan in space, which is kind of what I want from this show. And I had a good time with it, despite despite some of the dumb things. I liked that Grievous used all four arms, which we haven't seen in the show previously, which is very menacing, and why wouldn't you use it? And he spider-crawled like he does in the movie. And I honestly, like, the fact that Galea was independent was smarter than the male Jedi that never got trapped and actually had to save the people that did get trapped seemed like such a breath of fresh air that maybe I'm giving this episode more credit than it deserves, but I liked this one. Mark? Oh, I, I thought it was tremendous. I mean, it's, you know, problems with physics aside. Um, it was really well paced. Um, it was, yeah, lots of exciting battles. Um, one of my comments, one of the notes I had written here were finally some decent battle droids. Um, it was throughout the whole thing, it felt evenly matched. Like, okay, these are actual opponents for the Jedi as opposed to, you know, Tom Servo with a blaster. I mean, it was, it felt evenly matched. It felt plausible that each side would be giving it the other run for its money. Um, I didn't know where it was going to go. Um, I, I did have some of those concerns about, oh, okay, a disposable female Jedi that thankfully were not realized. Uh, it was it was good. This is probably my favorite episode that I've seen so far. Excellent. Well, for me, unfortunately, it wasn't quite didn't quite hit the mark like it did for you guys. 
Um, I rank it sixth out of the eight episodes that I've seen. Of course, I didn't see the episode that, that you guys reviewed. But um, the great things about it, I think it continues a long trend in this season of great visuals. I think this was an excellent space battle. Um, I was a little disappointed about Eeth Koth because I know I knew that he wasn't going to die because he dies in Revenge of the Sith. And um, so a lot of the suspense wasn't there at the get-go. And sure, the, the new Jedi, um, kind of at the end, there was some of that. But it just didn't really hit its mark like some of the other episodes. And, and for me, episode, or the second season is such a step up from the first season. I think if this episode was in the first season, it would rank much, much higher. But um, I was just kind of bored uh, because I've seen so many space battles, even though this was a really good one. And so for me, it ranks six. I, so I didn't what's dislike seven? it because I know what's an eight because that's that horrific Padme episode landing at Point Rain, which was what that was episode five. What happened in that one? I don't know. I don't know either. But it there was a sense. landing. They landed somewhere. At Point okay. Rain. Yeah. Um. The rest of the the, the episodes this season, I've I've liked. You know. I mean, I I have it right below Holocron Heist, which anything with Cad Bane um, in it, I really like. And then he is great. Um. And then uh, you know. It's, it's way below my, my top two of Brain Invaders and Weapons Factory are my two favorite episodes of the series. So Yeah, yeah, but I, I will point out one more time, kind of in your favor as well, that, again, Grievous has never won. Yeah. This is supposed to be such a horrible, intimidating guy, he and he loses yeah. constantly. At some point, they have to build him up with a win to make him menacing, and that's... I, it blows me away that we're this far into season two and he still has never won in an episode. I mean, Ventress has won in an episode. Cam Bane wins almost every episode he's in, and the leader of the whole thing can't do anything. So, uh, nerds, let's get to other nerd news. Nerds, nerds, nerds. Oh, how many pews? Jeez. Uh, four. Four. All right. Nerd news. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, wait. Before we get that, um, so, um, quick point of personal privilege here. My wife um, has finally actually started listening to these episodes. Oh, goodness. And um, she had one specific request slash critique um, that when Luke Runs gives his um, pew ranking, he actually makes the sound effect noise when he does it. Pew, pew, pew. Four, baby. Those Thank three. You. Was it? Yeah. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> Let's get to the other nerd news, please. I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. All right, so it's my turn this week, and it's Halloween, as I've been talking about constantly. I Usually I'm forced to wait until the 24th or 23rd to make it officially Halloween season, but as I mentioned earlier, my partner has let me, let me start early, which means I've been doing wall-to-wall -wall horror movies at night. So uh, earlier this week, I threw in uh, my all-time favorite guilty pleasure of a Halloween movie that everyone else hates. Because, you know, we all like true crime, and we kind of all have our cases that we're really into. Like, Mark, you know a ton about Zodiac and EAR, and Maya, you know a ton about EAR and Summerton Man. Well, and me... And Install Woman, don't forget the And Install Woman. woman. Yep. And, but for me, like, the big one has always been Jack the Ripper. Like, that's that's what I read about. That's, that's what I investigate the most, have spent the most time in, have the most interest in. I love Victorian horror... So I watched From Hell, which stars... I love From Hell! I yeah, Johnny movie. Depp and Heather Graham. Yeah. And it is a movie that um, I I really love. I think it has, it's the Hughes Brothers, which is um, which I think is fascinating because they basically took... You know, they're known for Menace to Society and these kind of um, poor African-American movies. And they took this movie because they went, well, it's the same topics we deal with. It's just poor white people long ago. So we're dealing with the same topics, but the visuals in it are amazing. There's some dumb things in the plot, but there's some really accurate and fun things that they explore. But this movie is hated by multiple pe types of people. People who love the graphic novel, and yeah. I love the graphic novel. I do novel. too, but I saw the movie first. But th this movie has nothing in common with the graphic novel other than the theory they use. Other than that, there's nothing, there's nothing the same. So divorce yourself from that. People who like researching Jack the River hate this movie. Uh, because it's so stylized and it's a theory that is a real theory, but everyone knows it's a bullshit theory and it's very sound stage. Like, you know, you're on a sound stage the whole time, but I don't care because the atmosphere is 
still so great. And then it's it's a movie where a lot of people saw Johnny Depp in this movie and saw the trailer and just went, well, why did he remake Sleepy Hollow? This looks like the same okay. movie. So nobody loves this movie except maybe Maya and me, and I watch it a lot. So I, I went through that, but it got me thinking about what are movies that you guys watch that you love that basically everyone else you know kind of hates? Mark, would you like to go first or would you like me to go first? Well, I, I should go first because we've already touched on the one I would pick um, back in the uh, Am I Right, Am I Wrong? And it's Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, um, which... Look at it. You, you can't see him at home, but he's smiling. Two of us are going to like it and one of us is not Look going to. Look at how he is. Yeah, it, it's, it's a great movie. It only gets 38% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Um, it's pretty unloved, but in... Luke actually hit on um, some of the things about it that are um, pretty impressive. First of all, it has a remarkably good cast um, of actually talented actors, and it does have the best Billy Zane performance. I don't normally count him as a talented actor, but they basically allow him to just go nuts. And it really works. It's... I mean, obviously, he's playing a demon walking the earth, and so as far as you know, realistic performances, I don't know that it, it counts. But for what is required of him, it really fits well. You've got great actors like CCH Pounder um, and William Sadler. Um, it's it, it has a good backstory. Um, the, the whole idea, you know, pulling from Christian mythology, that there's this key that the demons need to get and it's filled with the blood of Jesus. And it's, it's corny, it's hokey, but it's just well developed enough to be kind of interesting. And the movie itself is paced well at times. It is scary at times. So there's tons of great actors in this movie. Uh, really good for the quality of movie that you think this is going to be. And that's partially because back when it was made, Tales from the Crypt was still a name that had some clout uh, because it was on HBO. And it was a place where a lot of really sort of B and C list actors, a lot of character actors, they could just kind of go and slum it and have a lot of fun. And so they could attract greater talent than a movie like this normally would. It's well paced. Uh, there actually is a decent amount of tension throughout it. Um, for those people who don't know about it, the movie is largely a bunch of people trapped in a house while demons are around it. So it has that sort of Night of the Living Dead, claustrophobic, uh, you know, people barricaded. And this is back before that that concept had been just totally overused. Um, I love this movie. And I have a blast watching it every time. It's just the right amount of horror mixed with cheesiness. It never takes itself too seriously, which helps gloss over any plot holes. Which is the spirit of the show. That's the exact thing that the show was, is that it was cheesy and it was corny, but it was self-aware and had a right amount of scary. And the movie encapsulated all of that in a way which Bordello of Blood didn't come close to, which was the follow-up movie. Right, right. So I love this movie. I watch it all the time, and it is the only reason I've ever heard of the band Filter. Nice. <laughs> uh, for me, and this is no surprise to anybody who uh, has listened to the show, but it's Fantastic Four, the most recent one that got like 7%. That was a dumpster fire from Josh Trank, and I don't know if I just love the movie or I'm just fascinated by it, but I really, really wanted a Fantastic Four movie that kind of did the ultimate Fantastic Four because that is one of my favorite versions of the Fantastic Four. And when I saw that first trailer, I was in with a sort of like dour music and they were going to incorporate a lot of horror themes and things that I just uh, really enjoyed out of, out of Ultimate Fantastic Four. And the first half of the movie, I got exactly what I wanted when Josh Trank was directing it. And then the reshoots, and then you, you hit halfway through that movie and it like cuts out and it literally says one year later in black. And it just falls off the goddamn rails in such a spectacular fashion. I love the cast. I love where they were going. Um, and it just it, it just explodes so beautifully. Like like uh, just Kate Mara's like, wig alone 
watching it shift in and out of her wig that isn't even re remotely close to the hair that she's using when it's her own hair. Like, the insanity that you thought that was passable why, is why, fascinating. And, and here's the question that I have is, like, why not just suck it up, the fact that it's a year later, and use whatever hair she has and just dye that blonde? Or why didn't you just CG off, CGI off her hair and add in new hair like Henry Cavill and it would have looked <laughs> even better? Or what you could do is have Simon Kimberg sign up for a new Fox movie called uh, <laughs> X-Men Dark Phoenix and could, it is essentially just as or unwatchable. Allegedly. Allegedly. I'm still not convinced it actually was shot and is coming out. I do love me some Michael B. Jordan. Well, speaking, he is, of, he is amazing. He was the best Human Torch there was, and I, and I really did enjoy Chris Evans. Can I can I say a controversial statement? As good as as he was in Black Panther, I feel cheated that they used him in a one and done role. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, it cheated in the same way that uh, Heath Ledger feels cheated, where you don't get to see him anymore. Well, he was he was going to be in two movies, and then he died. So. <laughs> Speaking about slightly unrelated. Speaking of dying, I feel like this episode's done its death, Ben. Mark, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Wink Martindale Five. I am so at it's the square. Oh, he sure does. Oh wait, actually, that was Hollywood Squares. That sorry. yeah, you're not at Shadow Stevens, there, guy. Slow your roll. Right. Uh, Put an X there. <laughs> <laughs> I am at Luke underscore Nitzel. And I'm Maya Madrid. Found it, Maya Madrid, on Twitter. Together, we are kids. Seriously, we're gonna see you next week, everyone. Bye. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail dot com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter, at KidSeriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.